While we may not like to admit it, the lust for gold has helped shape this country of ours. In fact, the very bedrock of our social structure is built upon a lapidarian mass of greed, envy, and social vulgarity. Although steel and wooden bits helped build this railway, it is in fact built on something far less solid. It's built on money. When gold was discovered by smelly, hairy Anglo-Saxons in the 1860s, it began a roller coaster of greedy shenanigans that continues to this very day. Gold. Gold filling men's veins with a fever of riches. News acting like magic and spreading through the land like fire. Gold from the keep it dark. Gold from the rise and shine. The arrow, the buller. Many of the initial transactions between Maori and Pākehā involved a form of barter that seems inconceivable by today's standards. Pākehā wanted land and Maori wanted the new technologies of the empire, as illustrated by the deed for the piece of land that is now known as Wellington. 100 muskets, 2 tasses of tobacco, 40 iron pots, 20 kegs of gunpowder, 1 dozen umbrellas, 20 pocket handkerchiefs, one gross of Jew's harps, 10 dozen looking glasses, 14 But pigs, times have changed and sheep. you'd be hard pressed to trick a modern Maori with such Machiavellian mercantile madness. 27,995? 27,995. That'd be your last? Yeah, definitely. What about 12 muskets, 10 blankets, uh, 40 tomahawks, a relative foot spa and a juice harp? Um. In the past, wealth has been generated by flogging off our natural resources, by farming the land, by building cities. But more recently, another activity has come to the fore, the buying and selling of trinkets. Among those to make a fortune from flogging shiny objects is the great cut-price jewellery entrepreneur Michael Hill Jeweler. Hello, Michael Hill. <laughs> You're emptying a war zone here, all you chaps here, the Michael Hill Army Revolutionary Army, this is it. <laughs> but he wasn't fighting for freedom. He was fighting for the free market. And by the 1990s, he had some 40 outlets in his jihad of jewellery. Michael Hill, the jeweller, is really Michael Hill, the general. All right, now you're all issued with these balloons here because there's actually gonorrhea and the enemy camps and we don't want, we want the Michael Hill scene to be prepared. Oh! But not all of his pranks are so light-hearted. Take this recent staff training session in Christchurch. I'm going to take one of those watches home on Wednesday night. I'm going to take one home with the instruction manual and I'm going to take it home as many nights as I need to and I'm going to be able to learn that. But then... Here's a way to grab their attention. Hill may have built an empire by scaring the bejesus out of his shop managers, but his more recent foray into footwear was somewhat of a failure. Uh, I remember that actually, that was about four years ago. Michael Hill had a dab or shoes, didn't work. Then we see that somebody else starts up this, what is it, shoe warehouse. They're doing God's work. I mean, I'm wearing a very elegant pair of shoes here. Mm. Put the camera on them, look at that. Beautiful they are, leather. They are good looking shoes. You know what that cost me? $15 New Zealand and Argentina when the currency collapsed. $15. What would it cost me here? $500. They're bringing the world markets to us. Well, they're doing God's work. Gold. Gold. Silver. Silver. Chain. Chain. Sale. Sale. Gold. Gold. Silver. Silver. Chain. Chain. Sale. Sale. Michael Hill. Jeweler. How was that? 
While any self-respecting businessman is sure to practice tax avoidance and sexual harassment, such things usually take place behind the closed doors of the boardroom. However, the pursuit of money has led others to break the law more openly. Looking like a stew, but a not-so-nice one, Freddie Angel's infamy lasted over a decade. With a seemingly unstoppable urge to smuggle live wildlife alive. Convicted wildlife smuggler Freddie Angel has been sentenced to more than three years in jail. Freddie Angel has been sentenced to another six months in jail. If it crawled, chirped, wriggled, or just poked its tongue out a bit. All right. Yep, you do. Freddie Angel simply couldn't resist the temptation to stuff them in boxes and fly them somewhere. Like some crazed animal liberationist determined to give our wildlife the OE that they had, so far, been cruelly denied. How many birds do you reckon you smuggled uh, out of Australia? From Australia to being talked about 3,500 birds all time. Most of us didn't give a shit about the Aussie animals he ferreted through customs, but when it came to our precious currency, things were very different. And yet Pretty Angel had no recognition that his unorthodox ornithology could even be a little bit against the law. I'm a bird smuggler. I'm not a bloody criminal. Shipped them out on Saturday morning for us. No. Freddy loved the limelight. You can tell bullshit if you wanted to. Yeah. He's got to find a buyer. <laughs> he impressed all of us at the time by being one of the first criminals to habitually use a cell phone, even taunting customs via that very device while cameras were rolling. Whereabouts are you? <laughs> Must be. We know where to get you. You're going away? <laughs> No worries, we'll be in touch. Right on, bye bye. Yeah. Got a reminder, <laughs> Kevin. Uh, <laughs> Cheeky <Sorry>. deal. <laughs> I've carried birds for 36 hours on a plane, and they all lived on the other side. To his credit, unlike drug, carrot, or marmite smugglers of his time, he saved our sacred fauna the ultimate long haul indignity. Freddie chose instead to stash his parrots in his socks and undies and stuff. In your socks like this. Sadly, Freddie Angel made the news only one more time when he met his own confined box as a state highway statistic. Rock stars and drugs, whoop de doo But what about the Salvation Army and a few kilos of Charlie? Revelations wasn't any use at all in warning of the shock that was to befall the Salvation Army band leader, Robert Stewart. It is one of those stories with enough bizarre elements to have made a best-selling novel. Robert Stewart, a previously upright Gisborne builder, conductor of the local Salvation Army band, family man, had wound up in big, big trouble. He was a desperate man, owing thousands to a Nigerian pyramid scheme that still hasn't begun construction. But at a Peruvian airport, he was found with his bag stuffed to the gunnels with snort. Did you try to smuggle cocaine out of Peru? No, otherwise I'd have had none of it. He maintains he was a bag switch blind patsy courier. But nonetheless, horrors were to befall this sad Sally. And they chained me to a spare wheel of a Toyota. Paying his way out of this midnight express station, he made it back to New Zealand, where he is apparently happily checking the tuning on his euphonium. Like the gold rush of the 1860s, New Zealand in the 1980s was a godless, money-hungry cesspit. It all began with a kiwi fruit boom that brought in millions of dollars for these zespri ni Chinese gooseberries. The growers' champagne breakfast that celebrates the start of the kiwi fruit harvest in May is already an institution in the Bay of Plenty. It was a decade of decadence 
and degustations. To some, it was a never-ending orgy of drinking... Champagne's ordered for 50. ..and spectacular spending. Money. 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 And lots of it. A Babylon of bad tastes and bad driving. It was, without question, a completely hedonistic time. I loved it. I had such a good time. Um, the parties were great. Moat was selling at about 20 bucks a bottle, and everybody had it. The parties were huge. They were unbelievable. It's like what Rome must have been before the fall. Unlike Rome before the fall, the parties were sometimes held on trains. It was a cascade of champagne, a tour de force of fornication and free market frivolity. And while the peasants may do with what is spaghetti and spumante, the fat cats partied like it was 1999. It was the most exhilarating, exciting time. We were driven by our egos, but not by our pockets. There's nothing wrong with being driven by your pocket, mind you, but we simply weren't. I mean, I found myself worth $700 million, and I had no bloody idea until we actually one day totted it up. Chris Lewis, the tennis player, was with me. And he said to me, you must be worth a bit. It wasn't hard to add up. Set, oh, that's a lot of money. And I remember going over to my wife. We were in my place in Terry. I said, Anne, Anne, I'm worth $700 million. Oh, that's nice, she said. Tell Chris was, I'm serving lunch in 10 minutes. <laughs> now, truly, that's what she said. Such was the wealth in the 80s that even the spastics and cripples were better off. But their wealth didn't derive from Rogernomics. It came from another 80s phenomenon. Tell the people what that phenomenon was, Gerard. Now I can't. Well done. Oh, oh, oh. Here we go. We Telethon struck the country like a virulent dose of hep C, and everyone succumbed to the intoxicating fever. For 24 hours, the country was mad, and children were allowed to stay, invalids were allowed to stay up all night. Hospitals completely changed all their routine so everybody could watch the telethon. Marty, over to you. Right, we have from North Shore, hmm, junior black power, ladies and gentlemen, Glenfield. Some more, some more hooligans there, yeah. Some more hooligans, yeah. <laughs> Twenty dollars they've raised, thanks guys, and challenge all headhunters, Ponsonby. Are you enjoying this? Very much indeed. I must be very peculiar. <laughs> It was a heady mix of whistling tummies, celebrities, and amateur theatrics, with third world production values that defined a generation. And what worth have you got anything else there? Um. And now for something a little bit risque on Telethon. Uh, while you're getting it all on, as far as donation concerned, up in K Road, they're getting it all off. Let's get up to K Road. Grand Happy Road in Auckland is known for strip clubs and places like that. But they're also pulling their weight this year. With me is Rainton Hasty. Uh, Rainton, you're doing something a little bit unusual this year. Well, you've got a peepathon. What's a peepathon? A peepathon, that's a good one. Yeah, well, we've got the peep show here and the 50 cents from. One o'clock, one, one a.m. Rainton Hasty's Peepathon was the highlight of all telethons and is still talked about in television circles to this day. What do they actually get to see? Well, they see all our lovely striptease artists in there and uh, they're disrobing and they go into a private booth and uh, they watch the girls through a little peephole. And how popular is it? I mean, how much money are you making? Oh, I couldn't, uh, couldn't disclose that. We, uh, that might upset the tax department. <laughs> Suffice it to say, it's making quite a lot of money for Telethon. It is, certainly is, yes. I think it'll be uh, several hundred dollars anyway. Okay. Keep the of parking. Okay, come on, boys. All the money goes to Telethon here. Put your 50 cents in the machine. Now's your chance. And next door in the Pink Pussycat, or perhaps a more traditional home of striptease and Karanga Happy Road, the girls are passing around the hat. Yes, indeed. No more I And then, and then that woman, Lisa Gibbons, she came over and she fell in love with that Coronation Street guy. Lisa Gibbons says she and Christopher Quinton met for the first time when they came to New Zealand as guests for Telethon. And then the whole nation. 
Yeah, they fell in love on Dow Telethon. And then they're going and now they're married and they met here on our telethon. The love struck pair went on to have two children, but have since broken asunder. As for Chris, things have truly turned to shit. His character on Coro Street was stabbed to death, and then he tried unsuccessfully to become a Tory MP. Some of those international stars were amazing. Lauren Bacall vacated her seat to have an uh, assignation with a young television producer, and she didn't come back. A dark cloud of foreboding covered New Zealand as July the 10th, 1967 loomed. 10th July. July the 10th. July the um, 10th this year? That date has since been blamed for everything from the Wahina disaster the following year to a subsequent rise in homosexuality. It was our daring leap into decimal currency. The overarching desire for this change came from the government, who felt that very shortly only the most primitive nations would still be using pounds, halfpennies, and farthings. Every other country in the world has announced their intention to change the decimal currency with the exception of Ireland, Gambia, Malawi, and Nigeria. And hence, people from such nations were given special exposure sessions to familiarise themselves with this new cash system. One thing was thought certain, it was not going to be easy. And so the populace was rallied as to war, to help wrench us from the pound. Two shillings. There was a vigorous advertising campaign. Stand by to get a black and up on it. Black and up on it. These are the new coins. One cent, two cents, five cents, ten cents, twenty, and fifty cents. And spot quizzes were held in the dairy. What's thirty-five cents in shillings and pence? Um, three dollars. No, no, you're wrong. It was a tough dog who devised our escape from the pound. None other than the already quite spooky Robert Muldoon. For that, who, despite uh, not looking straight at the camera from time to time, didn't help much by becoming rather confused himself. Well, seven pence is a little uh, less than six cents, isn't it? Uh, you work it out, you see. Uh, you've got to get an exact conversion. If you've got a six cent fare, you have to have either five cents plus one cent, or the next round coin above, which is 10 cents or a shilling, and get change in cents, and it's quite simple there. Uh, again, this sounds confusing. It even sounds confusing to me saying it. But new currency meant a whole new look. And what on God's earth should our money look like? What's important with these coins uh, is the design. And we originally opened a public competition to interest the public in what they would have on their coins. Disaster was narrowly averted when a fourth former from Mount Albert Grammar pointed out that a run of at least 12 million coins depicting the conquest of Everest was actually Sherpa Tenzing and not Hillary. Other artworks considered included sexual positions from the Maori book of Kama Hutra and the controversial Ray Columbus Discovers New Zealand. How would those thought most vulnerable, less decimally capable cope? Children were interviewed at an inappropriate distance. 
How much are you changing? Um, five shillings. I see. You, you want 50 cents? Yes. You knew it was 50 cents? Yes. Good. As were the shy. What sort of questions have they been asking? And lovely old ducks. Just wondering how you're getting along with uh, decimal currency. Oh, it's really well. You, you, you. You're understanding it. Yes. It's not yes. making shopping difficult no. for you. No. No. That's fine. Not made any mistakes so far. No. No. Not so far. I just um, ask them how much it is in uh, pounds in pence. I see. And they explain the conversion to you. Good. But the predicted disaster. Never happened. Are you finding it easy dealing in dollars and cents? Yes, very easy. Yes, I think they're rather nice. And we all went to bed pissed, just like Y2K. I'm sure there'll be public apprehension up until the time of the changeover. And after that, people will be saying, well, what were we worrying about? The subject of decimal currency inspired several songs and was even referenced in the popular sitcom Dr. Rangi. I don't know, Dr. Rangi. This new decimal currency is far too newfangled for an old girl like me. Yes, Mrs. Holyoke. Ah. Well, Mrs. Holyoke, there's nothing wrong with your daughter's labia. It's all in perfect working order. Oh, Dr. Rangi, it wasn't my daughter's labia that needed attention. It was mine. Oh, I'd forget my own labia if it wasn't screwed on. <laughs> oh, Dr. Rangi. <laughs> it's obvious that our quest for money has left this nation facing a fiscal crisis of colossal proportions. As we plunge closer and closer to third or even fourth world status, New Zealanders continue to borrow more and more for peculiar pecuniary predilections such as plasma screens, property schemes and plain old pee. By the end of the decade, 80% of New Zealanders will be living in conditions just like these. In this, our Aotearoa, land of money. <laughs> 